introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've only been in Melbourne for about three or four months, so it was very nice to come back to Wagga this morning and see, like, you know, sheep and cattle and things like that. So it's, um, I'm definitely missing that in the big smoke. Um, but yeah, so as, as Steve said in um, his introduction, I'm giving a bit of a presentation today on just a bit of an overview of some of the research that's been happening in industry, um, looking at the welfare of cattle in feedlots. Um, yeah, so I've, I'm really looking forward to some questions in the question time because I know it can be kind of a controversial area, um, but really I think it, it need not be because when we think about animal welfare, everyone's in the same boat. We want to, you know, we care about the animals that we work with as scientists, as producers, as people that eat their products. And so we have this real common goal where everyone wants to see, you know, the, the best quality welfare for that animal. Um, and not only because it's, it's important to society, but also because it's important to production and things like that. All right, so yeah, to get started with, I'm just gonna talk about why we think cattle welfare is important. So when I think about the importance of, of, um, of animal welfare in general and of, of cattle welfare specifically, there's sort of three facets, facets to this. First and foremost, animals that you know, that we work with and, and animals that we own, they have the, the ability to experience things. So they can feel fear, they can feel hunger, they can feel pain, they can experience positive situations as well. So because we have this, you know, we're working with these animals that have this sort of capacity for this, this feeling, you know, that, that's important in its own right. But not just that, it has these other, these other facets involved. So, for example, we have that production and profitability in, involvement. So how an animal feels about things is impacting on its, on its profitability and its production. At the same time, we have this overarching thing about this social license to operate. And that's a real buzz phrase at the moment, this social license to operate. And basically what that means is that, you know, in any sort of industry, we need to make sure that we're operating in an ethical manner. So we need to make sure environmentally we're addressing concerns that, you know, that the wider population have, and in an animal welfare point of view as well. So I really think that all three of these aspects together are, are combining as to why understanding the welfare of cattle in feedlots is important, and animal welfare more generally. At the moment, we have a really good understanding about the, the impacts of welfare on profitability and, and production, and vice versa as well, how production influences the welfare of the animals. But what I want to talk about today is just three examples of how this sort of area of animal sentience, so the, the area of how animals can, can feel and experience things is actually impacting on these other two um, spheres here. And so I'm going to talk about the adjustment of, um, of animals into a feedlot environment, but that doesn't just apply to a, a feedlot environment. It, it also has a lot of um, similarities as to how we're handling animals on farm and how they're sort of experiencing things on farm. Um, the human-animal interactions, which is the same sort of deal, it's really important in an intensive situation as much as it, as it is in an extensive situation. Um, and then finally, some really novel research that's happening at the moment on the perception of, um, of, how, of the environment, so how animals actually perceive their environment. Okay, so just to get started with, when we're talking about animals adjusting to a feedlot, naturally, cows are curious. You know, they like... They'll, they'll go around the paddock and they'll find that new thing that you've put in there. That's how lift blocks work, for example. They'll go and explore their environment and they'll, um, they'll explore any kind of situation that they have. I mean, sometimes it has not the desired uh, consequences or outcomes for that animal, but just naturally, they're, they're very curious and they like to engage in their environment. At the same time, however, they've evolved as a, a prey species. So when a novel situation is in their control, it's a really positive experience. But when a novel situation is forced upon them or in a, um, a situation that they can't control, it becomes a negative experience. And this is what's referred to as the novelty paradox. The same situation can be positive if it's in the animal's control and it can be negative if it's out of its control. When we're talking about uh, the, the welfare of cattle in... in um, sorry, when we're talking about the welfare of cattle in feedlots, we have all these different changes that's happening to the animal at the same time. So they're coming in, um, they're being transported, they're coming in and mixing with unfamiliar animals, they're on a novel feed source, they're in a novel environment. All that sort of thing is out of that animal's control. And so it's more tending towards that negative situation. The reason why this is important for, uh, for us that are, that are managing animals is because that sort of generates that, that fear response or that stress response in animals. As a result, it can have all these sort of productivity changes. So it can increase the, um, 
the well, it can affect the meat quality of the animal and it can reduce their growth rate, and it can also increase their susceptibility to disease just through this standard sort of stress pathway that happens, and that happens in all sorts of situations. But for example, this, this activation of the, that fear response in this sort of all these multiple changes happening at once is a reason why um, cattle become really susceptible to things like bovine respiratory disease as soon as they've come into feedlots. Not only are they in a very close proximity with other, other animals, which facilitates the transfer of disease, but they also have a, a, a reduced level of immunity because they're experiencing all these changes at the same time, which has these sorts of you know, production um, implications. One of, the, um, one of the, the ways an individual animal responds to those, those sorts of fearful changes is based on their temperament. So, you know, I'm sure we've all got a, a really good understanding of temperament. We know that's very genetically related, so it can actually be selected for and you can choose animals based on their temperament. And there's a whole variety of different tests that we can use to identify how an animal's, like, what an animal's temperament is. So things like flight speed, so as soon as the crush um, opens, how quickly they exit. That's referred to their flight, as their flight speed. Um, the shoot score as well, so how an animal is actually behaving when it's in that crush environment or that, um, yeah, the crush or the shoot score. So how disruptive it is, is it, is it in, or how um, agitated it's behaving, is it is an indication of its um, temperament. There's a, there's a variety of other sorts of um, temperament tests as well. So, for example, um, one of the temperament tests that's been developed in Europe is actually kind of a bit dangerous, I guess, where they sort of will corner an animal in a pen and see how it behaves when it's isolated. I mean, I'm not one that wants to actually be performing that temperament test. I'd much prefer to, prefer to look at how, it, um, what, how quickly it's exiting a, um, a race. It seems a bit more safe to me. But anyway, we have all these sorts of things that are present in the literature that show us how um, the, the temperament of an animal. This temperament is really important to understand because it's been repeatedly demonstrated throughout research and on farm as well, or in the feedlot setting, that calm animals, so those that are more relaxed in that, in, in that setting, those that um, move out of that, that shoot or that race at a slower pace, have better feed conversion ratios and have better average daily gains. As well as that, animals that are more excitable also tend to have you know, carcass traits that are, it influences their carcass traits as well. So they'll have a smaller carcass, they'll have less fat, darker meat, increased pH. So all of those sorts of things that are influencing, um, they're influencing meat quality and eating quality. These things together are, are really sort of helping the, the industry set the, set the story as to why it's important to start selecting for temperament. So this not only influences the animals as they're coming into a feedlot, but it influences how they're behaving on farm as well. And I mean, I'm sure everyone here, when, when you're looking at cattle that you're purchasing and um, in a sale yard or if you're looking at a bull that you want to bring in, you want something that's really nice and calm because not only is that making your life easier because you don't have this crazy animal that's going to break its leg in the race or you don't have you know, a really unpleasant experience as you're handling these animals, but it also has these benefits by these, you know, these dollar values or these, these dollar benefits by having a, a calmer animal that you're selecting for. So when we're thinking about how this sort of feedlot environment, it's really kind of combining these two factors down the bottom. So it's combining that animal sentience because that animal's having an unpleasant time, that, um, that really excitable animal isn't adjusting to that situation very well. It's then having a, a flow and effect into the profitability of, of that animal in a feedlot environment, as well as your you know, enjoyment of handling it. All right, so I'm just going to, um, I've just pulled out a few examples from work that's been done by the, the Sheep CRC just to kind of support some of this, um, this information in looking at flight speed and how animals adapt. So we can see here that the flight speed of, um, of animals, which is really a measure of like how, how aversive they find handling, um, is really quite consistent. So we have difference between Brahmin and Angus here. Um, with Brahmins being blue and Angus being grey. And we can see that consistently they're responding, um, that they're, they've got really quite a consistent response in that, that flight speed. So that shows that we can select for animals because, by measuring their flight speed once, for example. That's, that's almost enough. Um, we can also see that their flight speed changes depending on their situation. In a paddock environment, that flight speed is faster, but over time, as they, um, they're handled more, that flight speed increases. So they're actually becoming a little bit more calm, for instance. Um, similarly, we can look at their, their average daily gain and how that um, associates with their, their temperament score. <coughs> so we have um, a, an example here where animals of poor, mixed or good um, temperament 
poor temperament is sort of animals that are excitable, good temperament is animals that are calm. And we can see how that affects their average daily gains. So initially upon entry into the feedlot, so this is um, between zero and 21 days um, on feed, their average daily gain of good animals is higher than, than those that have poor, um, that poor temperament or that more excitable temperament. Um, this uh, averages out a little bit over that extended period of time in the feedlot, but overall, still with that th that final column, it's showing that there is that sort of that that sort of difference. Um, and I mean, it would be really good from a, an economic point of view if you're running those, if you're running the numbers, if you're looking at the, you know, what sort of production benefit or what sort of dollar benefit you're getting by selecting those calm animals versus those um, those those more agitated animals. Uh, as well as that, we can also see, again, that animals are sort of adapting to that, that feedlot environment with that crush score decreasing over time. Um, and again, we can see, you know, well, Brahmin would they just have that natural, um, a, a naturally a bit more flighty or a bit more um, excitable, but that's declining in time as well as we're handling animals um, and into the feedlot. They're becoming, they're becoming more calm and they're becoming more relaxed. So not only are they... If we can select for the temperament of the the animal initially that's going to make them more adaptable, but over a period of time they're going to adjust as we handle them and handle them in a positive way. And that comes to sort of this human-animal um, interaction. How we handle animals affects their performance. This is really clearly demonstrated in so many different aspects of, um, of production animals. We see um, production benefits in pigs, we see production benefits in dairy cattle when they're handled in a calm way or they, they enjoy that handling process because of a positive interaction with the, hem, with the human. Um, we can also measure this by looking at the flight zone of the animal. So how fearful they are or how far away they stand from you is a, um, a good indication of their welfare as well. And this is the sort of thing that's being used in Europe. This um, flight zone stuff is being used in Europe to assess um, cattle welfare quite commonly on farm. When we're talking about that human-animal interaction, again, it has that sort of three-way interaction with the, the why it's important to animal welfare. It's important to the animal, it's beneficial from a production point of view, and it's also important from that social licence to operate. If we're handling animals in a, a positive way, then you know, the risk of, of something being controversial is, is reduced. And I'm talking about controversy from a, a, public, um, a public point of view. Um, and we can see this as well in sort of how, um, how backgrounding uh, before and in, into the feedlot is, in, is, approaching, is influencing, the, um, is influencing that, that sort of fear of, of animals. So what we have here on this graph is the, the fear response of animals on the side as measured through that flight zone. So the closer, the, the, the lower the number, the closer the animal is coming to the person that they're in, interacting with. Animals that were handled in a positive way have obviously the lowest level of fear, which is nice, this is what we're expecting. What is really interesting from this graph is that we can see that animals that were handled in a poor manner, so poor human stockmanship, <coughs> had the highest um, fear response in the paddock, but as soon as you put a feed reward in as associated through a, a feedlot, that actually reduces. So you can, um, so in sort of a, a feedlot setting, that feed reward and that association that the animal builds from having uh, from, from learning that, that people bring it food is actually mitigating any sort of negative handling that you're actually experiencing compared to no handling at all. So I think that's kind of really interesting to show that, you know, these animals are smart enough that they're learning that this, this positive association between how we're handling them and that the, the food reward that's in goal, involved. Um, and then we can see the same sort of thing again with flight speed and how that's changing in time. And flight speed again is that measure of like the, the fearfulness of handling. Okay, and then finally I wanted to talk about some really interesting sort of research that's happening at the moment um, that's being led by the CSIRO. And it's looking at how, we, it's looking at sort of the, the perception that cattle have of the feedlot environment. Um, this is really unique to actually ask the animal the question of how it's feeling in its situation. Um, and this is really important when we think about the social license to operate. And I think particularly for um, intensive production, it's really important. It's really common that people, um, that, that people that aren't within the industry have this perception that as soon as you take an animal out of a big paddock, it's automatically got poor welfare. And that's not necessarily the case at all. We, you know, we can demonstrate in a variety of different species that in, to a degree intensifying the <coughs> production setting actually has a lot of welfare benefits. But it's really the perception of society that inhibits a lot of those, those sorts of changes. And this is a real issue that we need to, to overcome. 
one of the ways that we can over overcome this um, idea of what the, p the public perceive to be right or, or not right is by actually looking at, um, it's, it's by generating objective science behind things. And this is what this sort of work is doing. So like I said, it's looking at the perception of the animals for the feedlot environment. And we can see that, um, and, and this is important because you're actually giving the animal the choice to demonstrate how much value it puts on one resource over another. Now this is only preliminary work that's been published and there's a lot of follow-on work that's happening at the moment. Um, but just to kind of uh, give a bit of an example, when you have, thanks, when you have a, um, an open environment, so you have the, um, uh, the cattle have the opportunity to access pasture versus the opportunity to access a feedlot, we can see over time that the cattle will learn to go into the feedlot early in the morning and receive their and, and eat all their ration for the day, and then they'll go out and spend the rest of their time in pasture, just sort of lying around. So they're finding it really desirable to be in that feedlot during those feeding times where they're getting that feeding reward. Um, but then they also like just to go and sort of have that space and, and relax in the paddock. Um, this is only some preliminary work, and now there's there's follow-on work from this where it's actually sort of uh, imposing a choice on the animal. So rather than that animal having its you know, it's free reign to, to, to go in between the two, um, the two environments as they like. It's actually putting a bit of a, a, a penalty on it. So if the animal chooses to go into the feedlot, it has to stay in the feedlot for a few days. If the animal chooses to stay in the pasture, it has to stay in the pasture for a few days. And some of the stuff that's, uh, and some of the preliminary res results from this are starting to show that the animal is actually kind of really valuing this feed reward over the space. But, you know, further work is, is happening in this, but it's starting to show that really, this, this resource is more preferable to this resource, this space resource. So that's some work that's happening at the moment. And I think, again, like I said, to reiterate, this is really important stuff because getting objective measures on how an animal feels about its situation is one of the ways that we can address the concerns that people have with in intensification. And that's really crucial because, again, as it comes down to it, it's that, that three-way relationship between the, the production, the profitability, how the animal's experiencing its situation and how people how, how people in the general public are perceiving its situation. And that's really crucial because that what people are spending their money on is, is, is driving what direction, um, what direction animal production is going in. Okay, so just to a few take home points. I mean, it's really clear, there's a lot of clear evidence to show that temperament influences production in feedlots. Um, and this has a real strong effect and, and this can be selected for through, through breeding. Um, Human-animal relationships are really crucial to cattle welfare, but we need to do a little bit more research to actually, you know, quantify the, the production benefits of this sort of stuff in a, cat, in a feedlot environment. And then finally, it really comes down to this proactively addressing um, cattle welfare, where we'll be able to benefit um, the, the animals, benefit production, and benefit the sustainability of the industry. So thank you very much.